Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Challenging Lamella Keratoplasty Cases. Uh, as a brief introduction, uh, we know that worldwide corneal transplantation is one of the most common performed uh, transplant procedures with 100,000 such procedures completed globally on an annual basis. Uh, for nearly a century now, the surgical technique of choice has been that of penetrating keratoplasty, first described successfully by Edward Zerm in 1905. But we are increasingly using the multi-layered nature of the cornea to perform more selective lamellar keratoplasty. So as a brief reminder, penetrating keratoplasty is a one-size-fits-all solution for all corneal disorders where you remove the full thickness uh, cornea and replace it with a full thickness donor. But increasingly, we're using anterior lamellar keratoplasty for stromal disorders, leaving behind the uh, host's endothelial layer intact. And in endothelial keratoplasty, we leave the anterior stroma intact and selectively replace the endothelial layer, which is diseased in the patient. So let's start off first uh, by talking about anterior lamellar keratoplasty. There are various techniques described in the literature. The most common and the most commonly performed procedure is that of Anwar Big Bubble Technique or Decimatic Dalk, which is performed in just over 50% of cases. The uh, Meller's Lamella Dissection Technique or the Pre-Decimatic Dalk is also another popular choice. But increasingly, we are seeing the use of the Femtosecond Laser Assisted Technique or FALC being used as well. In terms of the advantages of anterior lamellar keratoplasty compared to penetrating keratoplasty, well, the main advantage is that we don't see uh, endothelial rejection because the patient retains their own endothelial layer. The procedure is obviously extraocular, so you remove the open sky nature of penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, various studies have shown that you can remove sutures earlier in anterior lamellar keratoplasty, and you can also withdraw steroids earlier, which has numerous advantages in patients who have glaucoma or other uh, ocular comorbidities. Uh, ourselves and other groups have also published that anterior uh, lamellar keratoplasty uh, provides a biomechanically stronger eye compared to penetrating keratoplasty, so this is another potential advantage as well. The main disadvantages of DALC are, are regarding the use of special instrumentation, the requirement for uh, further training, increased surgical times, and the difficulty associated with the challenging nature of lamellar dissection. So uh, my first difficult case would be uh, a big bubble DALC uh, in this uh, keratoconic patient. Uh, you see after the second injection, we get a type 2 bubble, which is uh, obvious because of uh, the clear nature of the bubble. And you can see clearly in the slow motion video that the bubble starts from the periphery and comes inwards. Uh, we use the double bubble technique to confirm the presence of the big bubble. The markings could have been better, but anyway, we proceed with lamella dissection, uh, carefully removing the anterior stromal tissue. And all looks to be well, and the uh, bubble confirms uh, that we're doing okay. I proceed to irrigate, and suddenly we have a macro perforation of the underlying decimase layer. In slow motion, you see how uh, easily and how quickly this decimase membrane ruptures. So we have to convert to penetrating keratoplasty. Thankfully, at this stage, I had not removed the donor button as an endothelial layer, and decimase was still intact. So I was able to successfully complete uh, a penetrating keratoplasty. We felt that this was an unusual occurrence, and indeed, we published this case report uh, in 2017. So the main point from uh, this uh, presentation and this surgical case is the high likelihood of a bubble rupture in patients who develop a type 2 bubble. So as you know, a type 1 bubble occurs in around 80% of cases. This is where you get a separation of uh, the stroma from the predecimatic layer. So this provides some degree of ocular rigidity. And it's been shown that this uh, predecimatic or Dewar's layer, if you like, has a bursting pressure of uh, over 1,000 millimeters of mercury. So you can see the bubble typically starts from the center and expands outwards. Whereas in a type 2 bubble, the bubble usually is much more clear and starts in the periphery and then expands inwards. Uh, the type 2 bubble occurs um, in only around 20% of cases, but it has a much higher rate of perforation, uh, up to 86% reported in one study. And this is because the uh, bursting pressure is much lower compared to a uh, type 1 bubble. Uh, 
And um, again, this is thought to be related to the fact that in a type 2 bubble, uh, the uh, predecimatic layer is not dissected, and therefore you have a much easier uh, chance of uh, perforating the membrane, and in this case, uh, we had to convert to penetrating keratoplasty as well. I notice uh, that Dr. Fazy is one of the panelists and one of the moderators, and uh, their group has actually published quite a lot regarding modifying big bubble techniques uh, in uh, deep anterior lamella keratoplasty. So if you're interested, uh, I've listed their publication, which was uh, in BJO in 2014, for those who are interested. So a few tips when performing big bubble DALC is avoid a needle. Uh, the video you saw from earlier on was from many years ago. I've now switched to a dissector technique, uh, avoiding uh, the use of a needle. Uh, I now use a dissector and there are many available on the market, Fogler, uh, Tan or Sarnicola. And also uh, an air cannula injector can uh, perform a much easier pneumodissection. I've already mentioned, but I'll stress again, that uh, you should be uh, beware of the type 2 bubble because it has a much higher chance of perforation intraoperatively. So this, uh, this presentation and this surgical video again highlights why we should avoid the use of needles. Uh, this is an old video. Again, I'm using a 27 gauge needle to perform the pneumodissection but I have just misplaced uh, the needle and it's been advanced too deep and then we see uh, a perforation, a micro perforation. But uh, in these cases, uh, a deep anterior lamella surgical procedure can still be completed using a lamella dissection or a mellis technique. Uh, we just need to be patient and we just need to avoid the area of micro perforation. But uh, taking our time and slowly uh, proceeding and refilling the anterior chamber many times uh, with air, we can actually successfully complete uh, an anterior lamella case. I'm removing the decimase layer from the button. I have actually stopped doing this now in cases of type 2 bubble because of the ease at which uh, the type 2 bubble can perforate. But again, um, our Iranian uh, colleagues, again, uh, Dr. Fazi and his colleagues, have, have reported the comparisons between removing the decimal layer from the donor uh, when performing DALC. And in effect, uh, there are some changes that are seen on confocal microscopy, uh, but there's no long-term visual differences apart from a mild change or mild difference in contrast sensitivity. So again, if you're interested, these are interesting studies that you may want to look at. We see a lot of high drops or advanced keratoconus in New Zealand. And again, I want to show this video to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, DALC or predecimatic DALC is possible in, in DALC cases. You can see that it's often the case that you get uh, some degree of um, micro perforation where the uh, decimatic rupture has occurred. But again, being patient and gently dissecting the stromal layers, we can achieve an anterior lamella uh, procedure, which is highly advantageous uh, in patients here because of the much reduced risk of rejection. So postoperatively, I'll just demonstrate a couple of patients who've had DALC, uh, and you can see that they still retain a, a deep level of stromal scarring. Uh, but visually speaking, these individuals do very well. They may not achieve 6-6 or 20-20 vision, but they certainly can achieve a corrected vision of 6-12 uh, or driving standard. And indeed, uh, if you look at Shearer's Dyers group in the UK, they have published uh, very decent visual outcomes in patients who have undergone uh, DALC following high drops. So uh, we definitely feel that DALC is a, the go-to procedure in patients with keratoconus, particularly in New Zealand, where our risk of rejection and our risk of high drops pre-surgery is um, pretty high. So finally, uh, I'd like to show you a case of extreme DALC as well. Uh, this is a patient with extreme ectasia, keratoglobus, very poor corrected visual acuity, contact lens intolerant. Uh, and I just want to demonstrate that even in these uh, very difficult surgical cases, anterior lamella keratoplasty uh, can be performed. You noted the peripheral thinning of the cornea. Again, I'm using a micrometer set at around 300 microns to create a superior scleral incision and uh, injecting air into the anterior chamber to provide uh, better contrast. We are able to perform a lamella dissection as described by Mellers. This is a technique that I uh, kind of learned from uh, one of my um, 
consultants at Moorfield, Steve Tuft, who advocated uh, the, the dissection being carried out from the edge of the trephination once you've gotten into the host. And in this patient, again, slowly we are able to perform the lamella dissection and tease away the stromal fiber layers. Uh, and we have effectively managed to um, perform an anterior lamella procedure, which will be of use for this patient because of the large nature of the graft. You can see the degree of extreme ectasia, the bulging of the posterior lamella, and the softening required to effectively flatten this cornea following uh, suturing. So my typical go-to technique of suturing is uh, the single interrupted suture, and we were able to uh, complete this anterior lamella procedure uh, successfully in this patient, and you can see the degree of flattening of the cornea compared to the preoperative levels. So postoperatively, this patient did very well and had an uncorrected visual acuity of 636, correcting to 612. You can see from the degree of uh, posterior ectasia and the degree of flattening that occurred following surgery, we get these uh, stromal stress lines. And uh, these were visually insignificant for this patient and he achieved very good uh, vision. Uh, his sutures were actually removed by one of the residents uh, 14 months uh, following surgery, but unfortunately he reported um, a week later uh, having rubbed his eye and uh, he had developed a quite a significant uh, degree of graft host uh, junction slippage and dehiscence. You can see that the graft is very much anteriorly protruded here, the eye is injected, and he had to undergo a resuturing uh, of the uh, graft host junction and wound revision, but he's been doing very well, and indeed his graft remains uh, clear. So a few tips regarding uh, anterior lamella keratoplasty and uh, the pre-decimatic DALC is that manual dissection requires a lot of patience uh, and a lot of perforations can be salvaged. If you look at the literature uh, by very prominent corneal surgeons, uh, I believe the Italians, the um, San Nicola group, have published uh, high 90s in terms of the percentage of cases where they are able, uh, they're able to uh, salvage a DALC procedure. I know that Dr. Fogler from Hyderabad also reports not ever converting to penetrating keratoplasty and always, always uh, giving DALC a chance because of the advantages it provides patients. Um, the other tip I would probably have to give you is that uh, avoiding early suture removal after manual DALC is uh, of importance because of um, the uh, wound healing response we see in these individuals. So let's move on to endothelial keratoplasty. Um, the two most commonly performed procedures are now DSEC and DMEC. DSEC was described by um, Mellers in 2004 and subsequently DMEC in 2006. And again, the advantages of endothelial keratoplasty compared to penetrating keratoplasty is um, something that everyone is aware of. Just to briefly summarize, the patients get a much quicker visual recovery. Uh, you can get uh, minimal problems associated with sutures, and indeed, many of the DMEC procedures now are sutureless. Steroids can be withdrawn earlier, the eyes are tectonically stronger, and because of the small incision and lack of sutures, we see a much lower degree of astigmatism. There are disadvantages, again, related to the complexity of the learning curve and the surgical difficulty associated with uh, performing these operations. Uh, and we all know that there is a risk of graft detachment and indeed interface related issues have also been reported. So uh, let's look at some challenging cases of uh, endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, the first patient is a 36 year old female who has eye syndrome and who has had multiple previous glaucoma procedures, has corneal decompensation following the implantation of a barbell tube, and um, has a significant degree of peripheral anterior synechi as well. You can see that she's only 36, so I felt that uh, the best procedure for her would be of Demec. Uh, the price group have actually published uh, that DSEC results in iridocorneal endothelial syndrome. And it's, um, I guess, important to say that these patients do not do well in the long term with DSEC. So we thought that DMEC might provide this patient with a better long term prognosis. So we carry out a triple procedure. Uh, in this video, um, you'll see that uh, we carry out a routine phaco emulsification, and then I'm removing the host's uh, endothelial layer, checking for tags, 
I used the goiter tube with a 2.8 millimeter incision to introduce the uh, tripan stained uh, endothelial donor. And using a very standard technique, uh, we can uh, confirm the orientation of the graph using the mozzarisis sign. And using the pin and roll technique, I'm able to open up this DMEC graft and inject SF6. You can see the presence of the tube in the eye as well. Uh, and the, the surgical procedure was very uneventful. And the patient actually did extremely well. This is the preoperative image and this is the postoperative image. And this is a video showing the presence of the tube and the clarity of the cornea. Uh, several months following the procedure. Indeed, we also published our DMEC outcomes in patients with ICE syndrome in 2018 as well. So a few tips, uh, DMEC can be performed in complex situations, but my advice to you would be to use SF6 tamponade in such challenging cases. My go-to routine technique is using air, but in any cases where there is a degree of surgical complexity, I prefer uh, SF6. Let's look at a few um, difficult, complicated cases. Uh, I'll show you the first video. Uh, this is a patient where, unfortunately, I had uh, been given a wrong incision um, keratome, and you can see this, the chamber is unstable, but I decide to proceed with injection of the graft anyway. Uh, the infusion is on, and perhaps the infusion pressure is too high, and I inject the graft into the eye with the infusion on, perhaps something I should not have done, and you can see in a moment that the graft very, very nicely um, enters and exits the eye. Uh, and, and as you can see, it actually comes out of the incision because the incision was slightly too large. Uh, and the goiter cannula can be used with an incision of 2.8 millimeters. Well, not to worry, the graft was still lying on the ocular uh, surface and uh, I rescued the graft, reloaded it. I was, manage, uh, I was able to inject the graft back into the eye and unfold the graft relatively routinely and uneventfully. And this patient has actually done very, very well. I have uh, over two years of follow-up for her and the graph still remains uh, clear. So uh, we definitely want to avoid injecting these DMEC grafts with a high degree of infusion, but I still feel that a suture uh, to the wound is not required in every case. I know many surgeons routinely suture the wound. And if you think this is a problem associated with DMEC, well, this is not entirely true. This is another case, a complicated case of DSEC, where the, uh, the marked DSEC endothelial button is introduced into the eye. And then uh, the forceps, unfortunately, uh, are not able to grasp the donor tissue for very long. And suddenly the donor um, extrudes and expulses almost from the incision and actually lies on the conjunctiva. Uh, this graft was reintroduced using uh, Buse and Glide, but unfortunately this patient uh, developed corneal decompensation six to nine months following surgery and required a redo corneal transplant. So a uh, high level of infusion is definitely something to be avoided with any form of endothelial keratoplasty. So for tips, uh, I would generally suggest avoiding delivering the DMEC graft now with infusion on. And if the AC is unstable, I would definitely suggest you uh, to lower the infusion bottle height to much lower levels than standard. And uh, again, my advice would be that most cases of DMEC certainly do not require a corneal suture. I would suggest that 95% of my cases are sutureless. So this is a case of poor technique. Again, it's a relatively routine case of Fuchs dystrophy. Um, the graft is opened very straightforwardly and in a routine fashion. And um, using air, I'm able to uh, float the lenticule up against the recipient's cornea. I decide to inject more air, but I'm just not into the anterior chamber. I inject air too quickly and I um, cause this problem. Uh, so the air has to be removed from the eye and the uh, donor button again unfolded. This is highly irritating and frustrating, but I was able to complete the surgery again using a standardized technique, and I'm able to float the uh, DMEC lenticule back up against the cornea. And again, this patient has over three years of follow-up and has done extremely well. So uh, one tip would be to uh, create an air BSS exchange paracentesis in such cases, or indeed use uh, a small gauge needle to get your uh, air or SF6 tamponade. 
Um, the MEC can also be utilized in cases of previous failed PK and failed DSEC. I'm now stripping the tissue. This is a patient who's got a DSEC under a PK. Using a small incision, the DSEC uh, button is removed relatively uh, atraumatically. And um, I use um, Triapan Blue to check for uh, tags of decimase, which was not present in this case. You can see that I'm not using an infusion anymore, and I'm actually pressing on the posterior lip of the wound to allow for safe delivery of the DMEC lenticule. Uh, we check for the orientation of the graft, and relatively easily I'm able to open this DMEC lenticule. Uh, in a study, it's been shown that in post-PKIs, you should probably undersize the DMEC graft, so we use a 7.75 millimeter punch for this patient who had a previous eight millimeter graft. And this patient did very well. Day one postoperatively, you can see the cornea is already clearing quite nicely. And this patient did extremely well. So you can see this is uh, the left eye of this patient based on the sutures you see here. She uh, actually required exactly the same surgery in the other eye. And whilst the surgery was routine, she unfortunately developed um, a detachment of the graft following complete absorption of the SF6. You can see the degree of corneal edema in this video quite nicely. And you can see that the um, decimase membrane is detached in quite a significant proportion of the cornea. So I had to take it back and perform a rebubbling. And um, I thought I'd share with you some of my tips. Uh, and we'll just go back. The um, first tip is um, to remove the epithelium so that we can see what's going on. I know that you can just inject air or SF6 without removing epithelium, but if you had done so, you would have missed that there is a scroll of tissue here you should be able to see. And if you do not uh, oppose this, you will get a scrunched up DMEC tissue, which may well detach again. So I'm using some external pressure and pressurizing on the posterior lip of the wound to flatten that uh, scroll and I'm here injecting uh, SF6 again and this patient actually did very well following the rebubbling procedure. So a few tips using a needle for air fill titration is uh, beneficial. In DMEC post PK the evidence suggests that we should undersize the DMEC graph by 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 millimeters. I strongly suggest uh, to you all to record your surgical cases and um, whilst I don't do this routinely, I would suggest considering the S mark or the F mark in complex cases. And I'm sure you've all seen it before, but just a brief reminder of how this is done. This is the technique I use for a DMEC retrieval. Uh, the DMEC tissue is peeled partially, and then um, a skin punch is used to, um, to punch the uh, stromal layer endothelial side up. The lenticle is repositioned the stromal punch is uh, reflected and the mark is completed. So the F mark or the S mark can definitely help regarding the orientation of the graft in difficult cases. So keratoplasty certainly has a steep learning curve and I'm sure the corneal surgeons in the audience will agree that keratoplasty is not an easy procedure. But in conclusion, our corneal transplantation techniques are continuously evolving. Over the past two decades, we've seen a major paradigm shift from primarily penetrating keratoplasty to lamellar keratoplasty. This has basically provided us with lower rejection rates, improved visual outcomes, and reduced levels of complications. But we still need to see a more standardized approach to lamellar keratoplasty, and we hope that in years to come, these standardizations will take place. So thank you very much. I apologize I was not able to um, be with you in, uh, in person and live during this webinar uh, because of the time differences between uh, Iran and New Zealand. But if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer you through email. Um, thank you very much for listening.